Welcome everyone, I am Adeshawa Josh and this is Africa Matters. Schools in Malawi reopen after a two week delay as the country battles one of the worst cholera outbreak in decades. In the Kenyan coastal city of Mombasa, hand carts known as Mkokoteni, which are often used to transport goods, are now being used to keep the city clean. And we'll show you how an artist in the Democratic Republic of the Congo is using plastic waste to send a political message. Malawi is facing its worst cholera outbreak in two decades. The World Health Organization says at least 30 countries around the world have also reported cholera outbreaks since December, a 50% increase on the average in previous years. Health officials say the current outbreak has killed more than 880 people and infected at least 26,000 in Malawi since the first case was reported in March last year. Cholera spreads through consumption of food or water contaminated with the bacterium Vibrio cholerae and causes severe diarrhea. It can kill within hours if left untreated. The latest outbreak began in the southern district of Sanje and Machinda and has since spread across all of the country's 29 districts. Health officials in Malawi say they are currently administering the cholera vaccine and providing chlorine for communities to purify their water. But seasonal rains and poor sanitation and unreliable drinking water supplies are making it difficult to fight the disease. Local health centers are now feeling the strain, as Lamek Messina reports from Blantyre. The situation in the most medical facilities here in Malawi remains hopeless as cholera continues to spread. Figures show that an average of 20 people are dying every day. The country's top health authorities say the cholera outbreak is largely due to a lack of running water among a large number of the population. People are using unsafe water. Yeah, the reason being, uh, water from uh, plant water board they are not like there are some days where maybe there's no water and uh, this makes this makes people uh, they, they resort into using unsafe water from shallow wells and the uh, other sources in early january the minister of health in malawi closed the schools in the country's major cities of blanta and lilongwe to fix their broken water sources. It also announced restrictions on the sale of pre-cooked food across the country. Despite such interventions, cases continue to rise. Most healthy facilities are short of space to accommodate the sick. In Machinjiri Township, in Blanta, health authorities have converted a local public medical center into a cholera camp. Cholera is very easy to be spread. You know, it's highly contagious. So we decided to close this facility because we had no space to do other services. So we referred the patients to other facilities like Limbe Health Center. To contain the situation, health workers are educating communities about using safe and chlorinated water to prevent the disease. However, in a country where the price of water and disinfectants are high, poor communities, which make up roughly 65% of Malawians, feel the advice is not practical. I am too poor to be buying water at a kiosk at 200 kwacha per bucket of 5 liters. As a result, I resort to use the water which I feel is easily accessible regardless of its source. Malawi is now administering cholera vaccines. It received as a donation a month ago in areas where the disease has hit hardest. But as the stocks run out, the government says the prospects of getting more vaccines soon remain uncertain. Lamek Masina, Africa Matters, Blanta, Malawi. The WHO says cholera outbreaks remain rampant in developing countries, many of which are in Africa. It was estimated that 44 African countries spent an estimated 130 million U.S. dollars on cholera-related illness and treatment 
after recording over 1 million cases of the disease in 2015. So, why is it so difficult to eradicate cholera and what's driving the current spread in Malawi and around the world? Let's bring in George Jobe, the Executive Director, Malawi Health Equity Network. He joins me from Lilongwe. Thank you for making the time to speak to Africa Matters. Cholera is endemic in Malawi, but it often flares up during the rainy season. So tell me, why is the current outbreak so unprecedented? Of course, this is one of the rare, rare occasions that uh, we have seen cholera cases even outside the rainy season. Because the, the first case uh, came about around March in 2022. And the whole year we have had uh, cholera and the, into the rainy season. So uh, there could be a number of factors. The first factor was that uh, the first cases uh, we are coming from a neighboring country uh, into Malawi. And uh, also, at some point, uh, there was a cholera vaccine in the district which uh, those from the foreign country uh, came into through. But uh, because of that, I think there was denial amongst Malawians thinking that the uh, cholera was not for Malawians. It was for the foreigners who were coming. Uh, we think that affected us. Then we started seeing cholera uh, spreading, mm. uh, which is to do with the hygiene and the sanitation, mm. and also some other communities do not have uh, um, uh, safe water, for example. Uh, others have boreholes, uh, but the, some of the water is contaminated, uh, and others, because we have had a long time without cholera cases, uh, probably they relaxed, uh, they could not take care of uh, uh, water and making sure that they have uh, pit latrines. So what we have seen is the uh, uh, cholera cases from around March uh, mm. to this uh, period. And now in the rainy season, the cases are high and the, we have also seen uh, people uh, dying. Sounds like a compendium of problems. I'll quickly note three things you said. You said it came from a neighboring country. Malawians were in denial. How is the government factoring in these two factors uh, to avoid further spread of the disease? There has been a lot of awareness raising to the people, sensitizing them uh, that cholera is real, especially now that uh, the numbers are high and people are dying. Uh, that has been happening. We have also uh, seen uh, burning of uh, selling food, cooked food, in the streets. And uh, there have been uh, some guidelines to to the schools, to schools where we have our children. Uh, at some point, we have seen uh, burning of cooking food in uh, community gatherings. And these are some of the efforts that have been there. And uh, within the period or so, we saw uh, the coming in of uh, oral uh, cholera vaccine, mm. which was administered in expected, uh, selected districts. So the, the, this is one of the efforts. And uh, as a civil society organizations, our role has been ad advocacy, advocating for more resources, adv advocating for more activities uh, in the fight against uh, cholera, mm. and also advocating for availability of the vaccines, especially that uh, we understand there is high demand at the manufacturer, mm. and in Malawi waited some months to get the vaccines. Exactly. And now it is depleted. Yeah, so we have also been advocating with the World Health Organization to Let ensure that Malawi is in priority. How effective are these oral cholera vaccines? And I mean, I was going to ask you if they're readily available because it took almost uh, seven months after the outbreak had killed about 200 people before the vaccine arrived, the first dose uh, of batch of the vaccines arrived in Malawi. Uh, the, the vaccine has not come to Malawi for the first time because um, we remember around the, uh, 2015, we also had the I mean, the, vaccine. the first time fact, since the, this current outbreak, that's what I mean. When they did arrive, since this, yes. Yeah, uh, for, for now, we cannot talk much about its effectiveness. Of course, what we have seen is the uh, numbers are getting low, uh, um, especially where we had the hotspots and the... Uh, those who now um, 
testing positive for cholera are the ones who have not been vaccinated. So to some extent, we can say that the, the cholera vaccine has been uh, effective. We wish we had more uh, vaccines for more people because others have not been uh, vaccinated yet. We had uh, 2.9 uh, million uh, vaccines that came, and uh, our population is around 20 million. Jovo, let me Probably come in here quickly. So we both agree that these vaccines are effective. Is that what you're saying, based on the numbers that you've given me? But why did it yes. take so long for the vaccines to arrive in Malawi after the current outbreak? It took about seven months, according to reports. Could you confirm that? Yes, Do uh, we know why it took so long? Yes, we, we checked because uh, our role as a civil society organizations is to do advocacy and uh, social accountability. We checked and uh, we understood that uh, there was a high demand uh, at the manufacturer. Malawi ordered uh, the vaccines, but uh, it was uh, not, uh, it, it, it was on a long list, waiting mm. list. Uh, it had to take uh, some interventions uh, that Malawi got the 2.9 million uh, vaccines. Even at the moment, we don't know when we will get the next uh, consignment. That is quite and troubling. Are... That's quite troubling because people are dying. About 200 people died before the first batch came in. And now you're saying we don't even know if the country is going to have enough to deal with this crisis. This is very disturbing. My, yeah. but before I let you go, what role does the issue of drug resistance to the cholera strains prevalent, prevalent in Africa play in the spread of the disease? And what can be done to fix that? No, we, we, we haven't had any incidents of uh, resistance, drug resistance affecting mm -hmm. uh, the cholera uh, outbreak. Uh, because we know that uh, those who have been vaccinated, it has worked on them. Mm. But uh, it should also be appreciated that uh, because of negative information that made rounds during the COVID-19 period, uh, we have also had misinformation about uh, this cholera vaccine. Other people are ruling that uh, it is uh, another version of the COVID-19 vaccine. And mm. uh, that frightened others, and people were afraid. But we have seen uh, uh, towards the end uh, uh, the depletion, towards the depletion of the vaccines that now people are scrambling uh, for the vaccine because they have seen um, many people are dying and the, the cases are increasing. But the misinformation and negative information also came in to play a role right. uh, to affect the uptake of Words on Mabel. Thank you so much, George Obe, the Executive Director of Malawi Health Equity Network for speaking to Africa Matters. Thank you. And still to come here on Africa Matters. I'm Daniel Plafker, and I'll explain how creative campaigners in the Kenyan city of Mombasa have created a first-of-its-kind vehicle to fight back against the city's growing garbage menace. While well, collecting and disposing of plastic trash is a headache facing many of Africa's growing cities, one company in Kenya is trying to address the problem using a vehicle made from plastic waste itself. Daniel Plafka has more from Kenya's coastal city of Mombasa. In Kenyan cities like Mombasa, cargo transport is often a two-wheeled affair. Mikokoteni, or human-powered handcarts made of metal and wood, are ubiquitous in streets and markets. The locally made vehicles have long been essential for carrying water, wares, and waste. This is the old town community and this is a UNESCO heritage site. It's a coastline community that lives right next to the ocean. One of the major challenges in Mombasa County is that the, there is illegal dumping of waste on uh, open spaces, on pavements and also into the ocean. Taiba Hatimi saw her city's trash problem as an opportunity. Leaving behind a career in dentistry to found a tech-enabled enterprise focused on waste management. The city generates more than 700,000 tons of garbage each day. According to UN estimates, over half of that goes uncollected. The island city of Mombasa is short on space but long on trash. With conventional dump sites overflowing, collecting garbage efficiently requires some creative problem solving. So Baustaka has come up with an app that can be used by the community to book waste management. So it's like an Uber. We have, we're using a GPS system where the community can drop a pin and we can go collect the waste. Private companies pay Taiba to haul their solid waste away, while community residents can earn money by saving up recyclables to be collected in exchange for cash. 
I get a lot of benefits from selling the bottles. The money helps with feeding the children and many other little things around the house. The plastics, in particular, are worth money because they can be sold to recyclers or melted down and molded into useful objects, like the recycled plastic planks used to build this handcart itself. When I first heard about this plastic mkokoteni, I didn't know how it, how it, it would look like. But now, I use it. I used to pass these narrow streets, and like this, the three-wheeler that uses fuel, creating pollution, noise pollution, polluting air, and sometimes it cannot go where the, this mkokoteni goes. The model is a move towards a greener, more circular economy, with every trip of the upcycled handcart gathering raw materials for more like them to be made. But with so much garbage to contend with, it's hard for recycling alone to keep up with the growing plastic tide. Many campaigners are calling on Kenya to build on a five-year-old plastic bag ban by outlawing single-use plastics altogether. Daniel Plafter, Africa Matters, Mombasa. And from an eco-friendly initiative in Kenya, we visit an artist in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The United Nations says the country has more than half of Africa's surface water reserves, which could offer the country 13% of the world's hydroelectric potential. But that potential sometimes goes untapped because of plastic waste dumped in the water. One artist in Bukavu, Eastern Congo, is now hoping to use it to send a strong message to local leaders as Taibe Aydan reports. Congolese artist Patrick Chikuru Chiramwami is doing more than just picking up trash on the mountain of plastic bottles discarded in Lake Kivu. His work not only helps to keep the lights of his hometown of Bukavu on, it also helps recycle them into artwork at the same time. I chose the waste here at the Rizuzi power plant because this plant supplies the whole of Kivu with electricity. The waste that arrives here causes problems with electrical power supplies, which is why I made the decision to recover this waste to fight this problem by using it as an artist. The waste is dumped into Lake Kivu and it often causes hydroelectric power plant breakdowns that result in outages. The 26-year-old artist wants to prevent these cuts and send a message to leaders. He melts the plastic to make a thick liquid and uses it to paint portraits of politicians. The past presidents, the fighters such as Kasavubu, Lumumba, Mobutu Laurent Desiree Kabila and Joseph Kabila, even Felix Antoine Chisekedi Shilombo have all done nothing. They are responsible for the destruction of the environment. They should make provision for the protection of the environment. While a lone artist can't solve the problem of what to do about the massive public waste collection problem, Chiramwami hopes to leave a strong impression and inspire policymakers to help clean up the damage. Taiba Aiden, Africa Matters. Let's take you to Ghana now, where a vintage apparel startup is making second-hand clothes very popular. Western and Chinese manufacturers offload 15 million items on the African country every week, and many of them end up in landfill. But Gala Vintage's unique business model provides a solution that combines fashion and business sense. Shaib Hassan has the story. It's bringing in the cash and helping Ghana go greener. And it's being done by Vintage Gala with a simple business model. A rebrand of second hand to vintage and a promise to make buyers look stylish. Okay, so basically the idea of everything right now is just to inspire everybody to shop or thrift vintage. So we are not just saying second hand goods are second class stuff. So it's just trying we are just trying to inspire people that shopping vintage makes makes well then recycling better. Environmental care is also a top priority. At least 40% of the clothing dumped in Ghana ends up in landfill sites to be incinerated before being disposed. That's something Vintage Gala wants people to change, and that's where the business owners spend a lot of their time, 
getting the clothes back into circulation. We all know recycling helps the environment if, if uh, we are being truthful. So if you wear a cloth that has been made back um, in the days and you are not going to buy a new cloth but you want to wear something that has been made previously, that way you are helping the environment by not um, using raw materials, using other things to reproduce new clothes. The startup is not just direct selling to customers, it's also increasing the market size by helping sellers get connected. We are trying to um, connect the vintage community, the sellers, the thrifts, thrifters, mostly thrifters that are online, that they can't showcase their stuff outside the uh, online space. So we are giving them the opportunity to come outside their phones to sell to their customers. The idea has clicked especially well with the young and adventurous in fashion, making business good for Vintage Gala and better for the environment. Shweb Hassan, Africa Matters. Sustainable fashion, what's not to love? Let's take you to Nigeria now, where a United Nations report says around 40,000 people have been killed and 1.8 million displaced since 2009 by terrorist group Boko Haram. Its most high-profile crime was the kidnapping of hundreds of schoolgirls from Chibok, almost nine years ago. Now, a new exhibition is opened in Lagos, reminding the world that more than 100 of those girls are still being held in captivity. Boshua Goktash reports. These are the faces of 108 missing schoolgirls who were kidnapped by Boko Haram in 2014. Their portraits have been sculpted in clay and feature in an exhibition titled Statues Also Breathe. These girls are young girls. They are the future of Chibok land. They are my future as a father. They are the future of our world. Boko Haram militants kidnapped 276 teenage girls from a high school in the northeastern Nigerian town of Chibok almost nine years ago. The mass kidnapping prompted worldwide outrage and a global campaign called Bring Back Our Girls. Over the years, about 160 girls have escaped or been released, some returning home with children. It's a permanent reminder that this happened. We had a period in our history in Nigeria where women, boys, men, children were taken away. Some are recovered, some are still displaced to today, some are still in captivity. It's a permanent reminder that this happened, it's not a dream. Nigerians can't forget that this happened. Purun Nuri, a French artist, gathered photos of the missing girls from their families and recreated their faces into terracotta sculptures. She was helped by students from Obafemi Avalowa University to sculpt the 108 clay heads. For the students, for all of us who felt so useless when something so incredible happened and you cannot do anything about it, the fact of being able to at least give a little thing uh, through sculptures, through what we know how to do, uh, was uh, healing. The sculptures are set to go on a global tour following the exhibition in Lagos. It moves beyond Nigeria to like globally. And again, it just sort of like amplifies, uh, shows the world like the times we live in and shows people that you need to sort of like develop a sense of self for yourself and also develop a sense of identity because this isn't just Nigeria. Nuri hopes their faces cast in stone will remind the world of a largely forgotten tragedy. Bushra Göktaş, Africa Matters. And finally, we explore Gonda, a city in northwest Ethiopia. It was the capital city for many Ethiopian emperors. The historic city was listed as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 1979 because of its enthralling ruins. And it's back on visitors' maps after the signing of the Ethiopia Tigray peace deal. Have a look. <music>
that is our show for this week. Please share your thoughts and your suggestions about the stories you've seen on this episode or ideas that you would like us to cover on Twitter using the hashtag Africa Matters. Feel free to reach out to me on my personal handle. It's at Adesho Josh. Remember, you can watch this episode and more on YouTube. Just search Africa Matters TRT World. Don't forget to like, comment, and share. I will see you next week.